the connection. Thank you for sharing. Mm -hmm. So that we just go into this meeting with a sense of enthusiasm, excitement, and expectancy. Thank you, God. Amen. 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 All righty then. Welcome to Jody, Carol, hi Carol. Hi. Anybody else? Not yet. Okay. Well, this was um, this slide that you're looking at right now is. Maybe I'll put it in the Yes, please. You know what I think I should do first is just uh, a couple of announcements. Right, Jane? Yes. <laughs> So I'm going to continue this class into the first week in July. And then the following week, I will be out of town. And so I thought, well, maybe then with the loss of momentum while I'm gone for that week, that we would just take a break then until September. What do you think? Great. Yes. A break until September, after July, I think it's July 7th. Am I right, Kat? That first. So we'll continue with this, the topics in this book, through the rest of this month and the first of July. And I'm, I'm consolidating them. So we'll pretty much cover what she is talking about in your writing book. And then take a break for the rest of July and August. And then in September, I'm going to uh, start with uh, Unity, uh, I guess I'd call it Unity 202. I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about basic Unity. The five principles? The five principles and the tools that we have, you know, the, the uh, frameworks that we have in Unity. So there's, there's the, um, uh, the framework of levels of consciousness, there's the uh, framework of functions of consciousness, there's of course prayer and meditation, talk about denial and affirmation, and a little bit about the history and where we're at right now in unity. Are there books for them? Uh, the I know there's that, five principles of that. Yeah, the book that I recommend for that is the uh, Five Principles by Ellen Devonport. And I do believe we have that in the bookstore, don't we, Cam? Yeah. Um, will this be for new members? Will this be the required, this year is required for new members? Required for membership. Yeah. So I'll do that through September. And then coming in October, I'm looking at uh, a book by Desmond Tutu and um, the Dalai Lama called mm -hmm. The Book of Joy. Some interesting topics in it that I think I think we'll, you'll like. Okay, but back to the topics at hand. Hi, Alba. Glad you're here. Diane, can you uh, fit in around? I'm good. Are you good there? Okay. I can right. yeah, thanks. Okay. So fulfillment. This is from last time. We didn't get to it. As you think about your own fulfillment in life, what is it? How would you describe fulfillment? I would say that whatever I have is enough. Good. Okay. Good. Whatever I have is enough. This is Jody. Um, what I was thinking is that when I am fulfilled, it's when I'm, my self-talk is on target and telling me all of the right, supportive, loving things. Great. Thanks, Jody. Great. What else? Joy-filled and spirit. Joy-filled mm -hmm. and, and spirit. And spirit. Great. Susie? When I'm happy and at peace. Great. When I'm she happy and at peace. Betty Jo said joy filled and spirit, spirit filled. Yeah. The sense of spirit filled. Are you all thinking about it? 
This is Eileen. Um, I would say contented in myself. Great. Contented in yourself. Actually, fabulous. Anybody else? Yeah, Maya. I love everything everyone else has said. Um, and I think it, for me right now, it's just knowing that I'm where I am supposed to be right now. Mm. And then I have everything I need mm, great. To, to be here. Great. <coughs> great. Anybody else? <coughs> okay, well, I, I mean, I know you all have your own idea about what uh, fulfillment is for you. And so based on how you described it for yourself and the things we've heard and hear from what's been shared, what do you what do you say it takes to feel fulfilled? <clears throat> Faith? Awareness. Awareness and, of and being aware that you are an aware being. And it was interesting. Most of the things I think that were said were not sorry folks. <laughs> most of the things that were said had nothing to do with how much you had or how much you accomplished, but more of how you were feeling. And I think when we are aware of our feelings, um, that we can be fulfilled. Did you all online here, Betty was saying that it, what it takes to be fulfilled is awareness, awareness of your current state, just be aware. Remember, uh, have you all heard what the Dalai Lama, not the Dalai Lama, <laughs> uh, the Buddha, the Buddha in his uh, last moments of life, or earlier, I'm not sure, uh, was asked how he how he uh, became enlightened and what was what was important about that, and uh, and people were saying, well, are are you um, are you a saint? No. Are you um, the best guru? No. Are you God? No. Well, then what are you? And he said, I'm awake. I'm awake. So, which is synonymous with awareness, right? Uh, and, I mean, we would hope that that awareness is, uh, the content of that awareness is a spiritual perspective, right? Spiritual maturity, rather than the reverse. Yes. Well, following up on him, uh, what it takes for me um, on the days that I feel more fulfilled is the right living, the eight ways of right living, including right speech and, you know, these these Buddhist points, because um, that's always a goal. Yeah. It's always yeah. a goal. It wasn't that it, his, uh, the Buddha's summary of what it takes to be enlightened and awake uh, the eight, the eightfold path, right? So right thinking, right speech, right action, right emotions. I'm not sure what the right, right work, maybe, I'm not sure. I've got them up on the ball, but I've got them all. But yeah, I mean, there's always one to be, one or two to be striving more towards, yes. you know? Yeah. And then I think the, the what is it for me, the fulfillment part of it is, um, when I feel proud, when I can see some growth. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, this lady said it, awareness, consciousness of how we're growing. And so instead of just saying, oh, I've got these two, I still need to work on. It's like, oh, well, I've done better in this area. And so kind of fulfilling. It's like we're being filled up and we're not, never totally full. Yeah. Yeah. There's always more. Always more of God to experience. Great. Anyone online want to comment? What does it take? Carol? Yeah, I'll add. What I think it takes is what everyone has already said, but also letting go of what isn't important and what isn't me. Right. Great. It's a lot of release and just letting my true essence come through and be spiritually led. Great. Thank you. Jody? Um, also, I think when I'm fulfilled, I'm living in gratitude. Mm, great. Great. Thank you. Anybody else before I? Yeah, yeah this is Kathy. I, I think it also takes faith. For me, it takes faith that 
I know that God's only good. And so I, I anchor into that. Great, good point. Good point. Betty Jo. Yeah, knowing you're, you're worthy and your wholeness. Great. Knowing that you're worthy and knowing your wholeness at the core of who we are. Great. Anybody else? How are, what, what are you thinking? It's, it's slightly off the subject, but you made a comment that when Buddha was asked if he was God, he said no. And I believe Jesus never thought he was God. And I suspect Muhammad never thought he was God. But yet we humans keep putting them in that God station. We think of Jesus as God and and I'm sure the Buddhists think of Buddha was God. No. Which tells me that uh, maybe there is only one God. But also, why do we have to differentiate our inferior self from somebody who we perceive to be more superior? Like, why do I have to look at Jesus and say, he must be God because I'm a mere mortal? And I'm sure the Buddhists say the same thing. With all my frailties, Buddha must be God because he's far more uh, uh, involved than I am. Well, I was probably in error there when I made that one of the questions that was asked of Buddha. You misled me. I did mislead you. <laughs> and uh, I would never do that on purpose. <laughs> But <clears throat> but let me go back to scripture and so you said a lot. Uh, there are uh, about three things you said that I would love to touch on. But here's the one that comes to me now, and that is uh, Jesus did say, "Ye are gods. Ye are gods." And he also said, "I and the Father are one." Now that's an English translation of Aramaic that's been translated to Greek and Latin and who knows what else by the time we get it in English. There is a, a, uh, an Aramaic translation of the Lord's Prayer that refers to God as something like the allness of light or something like that, you know, not a being like Father points to God being a being and that's not what Jesus really said. And uh, it's not what unity teaches, right? Unity, unity teaches that um, God is the creative principle, not a being like father or mother, or a being that you can identify as a God. That God is the creative principle of absolute good. And that since that, and you know, science and uh, quantum physics and all, all of the sciences today are, well, I shouldn't say all, but the metaphysical approach is that everything is energy. Everything is energy. And so in unity, we think of God as the creative energy of absolute good. And when we align with that, we're aligning with that creative principle. We're wanting ourselves with that creative principle which is what Jesus was pointing to, that, uh, that he was in God and God was in him and we are all one, he said, and we are all one. So that was it. <laughs> Betty? Yeah. This morning I was listening to something that Betty Jo had referred me to with uh, Roar and Bob. Oh, Richard Roar? Richard Roar, yeah. And they were talking about a scientist who was saying that the true trinity can be found in the atom, which is a nucleus, let's see, proton, neutron, whatever. Electron, the, proton, yeah. and neutron. Right. And that, and I said, oh good, because we're all saying that God is energy, and here we're talking about it on a scientific basis as well. I just wanted to let you know I finally got to listen to it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Richard Rohr is a uh, Franciscan monk, I guess he refers yeah. to himself as a monk, not a priest. Right. And, uh, 
I just picked up another book by him, which is called Everything is Sacred. Yes. But Rohr is, he articulates what Matthew Fox was articulating 20, 30 years ago. You all know who Matthew Fox is, right? So Matthew Fox is a Catholic priest who was defrocked for his, his approach to God, what he's, his understanding of God. And he talked about cosmic consciousness, the cosmic Christ. Richard Rohr talks about the same thing, same term, cosmic Christ, cosmic consciousness. So, uh, and unity is always in life as consciousness. So I'm curious um, what unity does say about Jesus, because following up on this gentleman's uh, question. This, this uh, gentleman's name is Howard Harold Jan. Howard. <laughs> Howard, what a great question, because I wonder too, I mean, uh, actually the, the Buddha never suggested he was God. He was very humble, he's a teacher. Muhammad was the teacher. Uh, it, it must be just the Catholic Church and the, those people that came up with Jesus being the son of God. So, so because I follow Richard Rohr carefully, he brings all these teachers together. And so does unity then say that uh, Jesus is, I, I think of it as Wayne Dyer. He always said that um, uh, the, the source, he always used to speak to the source and we're plugging into the source. So there's that energy concept again. Uh, but does unity teach anything about Jesus being the son? Where did this son of God come from? <laughs> I guess is what I'm asking. Yeah, yeah. Well, <clears throat> Jesus did say we're all sons of God. Yeah. But again, we're talking about an English translation of an Aramaic term, which is uh, non-gendered. And so, uh, so where unity, what I love about unity is that it has a clear Christology. That um, if we say that Jesus is the son of God, what we're really saying is Jesus is the most advanced, evolved expression of the one creative principle of absolute good, the most evolved of human beings. And he is, we refer to Jesus as our way shower. Okay. And not the only son of God, but the demonstration of what it looks like for a totally enlightened human being, capacitated maximally to express the one creative principle of absolute good. Okay, that's great. It's all in the translation, isn't it? <laughs> oh dear. Anybody online want to comment? I hope you all heard Diane and some of the comments that were made. Did you? Okay, good. All right. <clears throat> so uh, are we ready to move on from fulfillment? So she, uh, this is something that Chittister said. Our spiritual obligation is to age well so that others who have who meet us have the courage the spiritual depth to do the same. How do we age well? We should all be able to comment on that. <laughs> why, why is there this kind of silence? Come on, you all, look where you are today. This is Eileen. Um, I think how we age well is to live the principles that we know are truth and to um, keep our body and mind um, in the highest uh, place that we can with um, gratitude and peace and love. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Susie? I want to say I love this book. I think it's great. Um, oh, good. Everybody should read it if you have. Um, it's a should, sorry. I, I want to say one concept of aging well, I feel, is uh, to be spiritually and, uh, I mean, mentally and physically active. Mm, great. Great. Like use it or lose it. Mm -hmm. Mentally and spiritually and physically active. 
and spiritually. Okay. <laughs> and I, yeah, absolutely. Thank I you. Would, I would say to be positive in our outlook mm. and to be open to new ideas mm. and don't complain. Right. <laughs> <laughs> no complaints. <laughs> <It's a good laughs> uh, is Mackie in the office? <laughs> What? She said, don't complain, and you immediately went to Mackie. Right? Yeah, so well, Mackie is a complaining. It's a right? private joke. Oh, okay. <laughs> I figured it was. I mean, it was. <laughs> Betty? Um, what she, she was saying about gratitude and not complaining, I think so much of that now is what I have to remind myself. Uh, to be thankful that I am up walking around. Yeah. I might have a back that hurts, but don't complain about that part. Think that I'm up walking around yeah. and that I have eyes to see and yeah. all the things that I do have. So it's a positive outlook uh, at your life. It's... I, you know, I think uh, it's such an important perspective as, as we all mature to, uh, to keep our focus where we want the result to be. So yeah, we can focus on our aches and our pains and uh, what isn't working in the body uh, or around us. And that is low energy. It's, uh, it's not good for our health. But being the person I have, I have to be a little bit of devil's advocate. Yes, I know you will. <laughs> Now, come on, you guys. A little bit of club complaining is okay. I talk to a friend or someone and seek some support and love for what we're going through. The only reason I say that is I think that, you know, this, this thought that we always have to be positive. I mean, I am listening to Louise Hay every morning to her affirmations, and they're wonderful. And I think that everything about aging for me starts with the thoughts and I get what you're saying all of you about keeping positive energy but let's go ahead and let ourselves listen to the reality of aging and seek some love and support for that and not necessarily consider that that other person's complaining I don't I feel like they need a good old hug or you know some understanding when they're in that place Scary stuff. Um, well, I always thank God for devil's advocates. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and what I want to say again is, I've probably said it in here before, and I'm always um, allured by the fact that spiritual truth is paradoxical. Paradoxical. And and that it is easy to, when you have come from here to there, to take all the complexity in here and simplify it there. And, and because we've been through the complexity here and resolved it, we can stand here in the simplicity, but those who are here can't get there until they've gone through here, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. We can't get to the simplicity of spiritual truth without having gone through the complexity of evolvement, of evolving spiritually. Well, you made me think of one more thing. Thich Nhat Hanh's book, No Mud, No Lotus. Yes. Isn't that a great concept? Yes, yes. And so um, paradoxically speaking, uh, we need to, one of the powers that we must, that if we want to evolve, we must master is the power of release. And remember we said everything is energy. So my negative thoughts, my, my aches and pains, when I think about them, that's energy. If I get it out, maybe it's not in here anymore. So we could look at it not as a complaint, but a release of energy and seeking of support. It's all in the perspective. Jane? What I've developed is I have a housemate and I'll come home sometimes and I say, now I know why old people stay home. <laughs> so then I have to tell myself, okay, you don't have to go to that place anymore. You don't have to go with that group of people.
people anymore. So analyze what it is that makes you say this, because I think, well, I'm an older person, but I did that. I don't want to do that anymore. So it's my way of not being in a positive way, but saying, this is what's going on, and at least I let it come out instead of letting it brew. Yeah. And, and that make, helps me make progress into, I don't have to do that anymore yet. Yeah. Yeah, yeah we have to uh, know what's going on up here and not deny the reality of what's on here. That's what awareness is, right? I'm aware moment to moment what's going on up here, what's going on in here. And I acknowledge it, accept it, release it, if it's not for my highest good. But even joy needs to be released, right? <laughs> Could I add something? Please. Um, I don't know if some of you saw America's Got Talent last night, but they had a young woman sing who has cancer and it's metastasized and she only has a 5% chance, but she was so positive and she said this, you can't wait until life isn't hard anymore before you decide to be happy. Aww. And it just was so removing to me that oh, that I was the that. wisdom that she had. America's Got I love that. Could you repeat this? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I'll say it again. You can't wait until life isn't hard anymore before you decide to be happy. And I thought that spoke to how to age well. It's just no matter what, decide to be happy and do the things and be the things that make you feel right with yourself and with your spirit and make you happy. Well, you know, you used an interesting word there called decide. Mm -hmm. Decide yep. before you decide to be happy. Isn't that what you said, Carol? Before yeah, and you know, the big thing I learned from Unity is that I can choose. It's something I never knew before I found Unity that I could choose to be happy. I could, no matter what was going on around me, I could choose to focus on positive things. That was one of the real big things that changed my life. Amen. Amen. We're not powerless. Mm -hmm. Pardon? We're not powerless. We're not powerless. Yes. And and there's, 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 also, there's also a saying that the greater the struggle, the greater the gratitude to overcome. Mm. The greater the struggle, the greater the gratitude. And the overcoming. And the overcoming. Betty Jo said that's true. That's true. Yeah. There's a simple saying, you're as happy as you make up your mind to be. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and it sounds so simple, but sometimes it takes a lot of work, <laughs> a lot of uh, chopping away. Well, and scripture, you know, scripture really speaks to all of us. That's one of the things I love about Unity's approach to the Bible, to scripture. And that is uh, Jesus um, said, I am the vine and you are the branches. And my father is the vine dresser. And my father prunes the vine to make it healthy. So, you know, for me, from a unity perspective, that speaks to us, us pruning our thinking, uh, pruning our lives, as you, you know, suggest that I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm not going to be there anymore. It's not good for me anymore. Anybody online want to comment? No, okay. It has taken almost a lifetime to love a sunset, to value company, to give up what has always been too much, and to learn to revel in what is enough, which is what Linda said. But it has been worth the wait, she said. Can you agree to that? People I'm, in class I'm working on it. I'm, I'm working on that. Uh, I'm, I'm still in, you know, the acceptance of the changes. I was always very positive, always created a beautiful image of what my future would look like, and it looked like it did. Yeah. So for me, it's learning to ex accept the changes and use all these tools that, that we've developed through our life to keep lifting me up keep reframing, keep adjusting. Uh, but I'm at a point because of my particular circumstances where 
it's not the happiest time in my life. And so that's just the, the truth of it. But I think it's it happens to everyone. And that wasn't something that was in my image of how were my aging years would be. I thought it was all going to be much, much different than it is. Like it, just an example is um, when I was in my late 50s, I went to an ashram in India and I thought I was going to sing to God and use my beautiful gift of singing. And I immediately found out that I was there to teach those younger than me. You were there to teach? I was there to teach those younger than me. Oh, okay. Or to, to like pass the flame. And I was not ready to stop shining, you know? <laughs> and that was a shocker. I mean, I resisted it. And I had to be, you know, kind of slapped around in a cosmic way to accept that, that that was a gift to be able to step back and pass things on and nurture the next people who are going to take over and be this, the shining stars. But I had plenty of time to shine. <laughs> and that's just an example of oh, how yeah. yes. things change as we age and we have to use our tools to accept them. And sometimes it's painful. And it is nice to have someone to uh, around to understand what you're going through and can can be there and support you through it. You get a wise word. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. Ah, yes. Thank you. Anybody else in here or out there on this one? Okay. So the next three chapters that uh, I, I was looking at are include her chapter on relationships, tale telling, and letting go. So <clears throat> she said this, at its core, life is not about things, it's about relationships. What do you think about that? Any comments out there in here? This is Eileen. Um, I think that, uh, without those people in our lives and our relationships to share our joy and to share our knowledge and, and um, spiritual wisdom with it, it, it's just kind of not as exciting. <laughs> it um, is so much more enjoyable to be able to share those things and to discuss um, what comes up for us and, and to help us in our everyday life. Amen. Amen. So Sunday, I'm talking about uh, the importance of a spiritual community, the blessings of a spiritual community. And you were speaking to that, I mean, the fact that uh, life really is about being one with other people, not like we always can or maybe ever can, but there, I think within us, there's this draw to uh, companion with people that we're not meant to live an isolated life enjoying things only that as if we say god is one and we're all one in god that it's not so good to be outside that circle yes howard well you know i've, I've had a long life fortunately and uh I've done lots of things, been lots of places. But the one thing, the relationship with Susan, it's always been there. And I would, hard to say it, but <laughs> I would give her all the things to keep Susan. Oh. Because you reach a point, and I feel sad about the people that are some of you that sure lost a husband or a, a, a spouse or or divorce of you I, I feel sad for you because man it's this relationship that is life mm -hmm. I can't think of any part of life that good part of life that doesn't involve so oh wow I love that <laughs> yeah. 
and the bad parts are like who? Stupid. <laughs> 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 That's so beautiful. If only all marriages could. Yeah. You can go to work for Hallmark. <laughs> oh, that's so beautiful. Yeah. Um, there are two young men going around the country, maybe the world now, speaking about minimalism. They wrote a book about minimalism, living a minimal life. And their motto is love people, not things mm. and that's so simple it's so simple and um mm. you can find them on the internet it's interesting how they point out what what we have come to value in our society are things and with things yeah yeah an important message uh, okay here's another quote from where but before we go forward, um, we couldn't hear what Karen was just saying. You mean Betty Jo? Oh, Betty Jo, okay. We couldn't hear. Betty Jo was Betty. talking about a couple of young men who are going around the world right now. Betty uh, was saying that their motto is love people, not things. Yeah. And Diane, what are you going to say? Well, I want to follow up on Howard's comment again, because that was such a beautiful comment. However, I, I've been married 30 years, and I wouldn't betray my husband for anything. Okay. But I've had lots of other relationships that have taught me so much, not just men, long-term relationships before my husband, but also with women friends. Mm -hmm. And I think that we can learn so much from each other, whether we're widowed or divorced or you know, single by choice, it really doesn't matter. You know, I, I, I'm reading uh, this quote on 98 that says, ongoing learning saves the aging from becoming more fossilized and transformed. Mm -hmm. um, the problem with aging is not age, it is rigidity of soul, inflexibility. For me, that's how I grow, is other people. Everybody in here is teaching me things right now. And it's just that perspective that we get from each other that's, um, so yeah, when our relationships begin to discover our life changes, and that's to me, um, you know, a forging for new, for new opportunities. Yeah. I would love for you to read that piece again. Did you all hear what Diane read from the book? I didn't think so. Diane, would you read See, that side yeah. again? So loud. She, she's talking about, uh, I think you said 98, right? Uh, let's see. It was on the chapter on learning. And to me, that's. Um, did I say 98? Yeah. I thought you did. It's on the chapter. Not, oh, yeah, I think it was because it's in that, that chapter. I might not be able to find it again. Okay. But essentially, it was. Oh, yeah, yeah. Ongoing learning saves the aging from becoming fossilized, uh, more fossilized than transformed. Because we get so much growth in this age. The problem with aging is not age, it is petrification. <laughs> That's to get the tree rigidity of soul and inflexibility. And that's something I'm always working on. It's not getting more inflexible and stuck. I mean, I was always an adventurer, and now it's like, oh my God. <laughs> Somebody talked about staying home. It's like, no, you're not gonna push. You're gonna push more as we age. Um, yeah, very important message. At any age, I was thinking, you know, that uh, to remain healthy and vital, we have to keep growing. And as uh, Diane read from the book, and not get petrified in our thinking or our feeling. You know, if we react, we respond the same old way all the time. Not good. Got to keep growing and expanding. Okay. And then uh, I think we did speak, Diane, you did a little bit to this one. The relationships we forge begin to disappear our own life changes. What does, so here's my question. What does it mean to forge a relationship? I, I have a, uh, 
problems with relationships. And I've moved a lot. I've had many husbands and adventures. And uh, the people that were drawn to me were people who needed help. And so I was always trying to build a, a, a boundary from that drain. And the other thing is, I always would put whatever uh, energy I had into whichever man I was with. Therefore, not building enough relationships with other, with other women. I would mold myself to be that perfect partner to that person, whoever it might be that I was with. Then I would take a break and have my, my sing, a little bit of single time and a long time, and then I would automatically be drawn to another man another set of friends, another set of circumstances, and more people drawn to me because I could help uplift them for some reason. So I never learned how to make friends. In other words, to, uh, to forge a, relation, a relationship with a friend, I need to be calling them, mm -hmm. not monitoring my calls and making sure, oh, it's that person who's going to call me, she just called me two days ago for upliftment, you know, and I'm not, I don't want to do it again today. So I never really learned how to do it. Beautiful. But I feel like I've got time now to develop that because I don't plan to jump into a relationship with a man at this point in my life. I want to learn how to be an older woman. <laughs> and a friend. And a friend. And a friend. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, what Maya was saying is that forging a relationship takes an output of energy, uh, reaching out. Let it begin with me. Exactly. My relationship lessons have um, been pretty much centered around personal growth in me. And the people I draw to me are to teach me to accept myself in different ways. Um, when I started out in relationship, I was one of those people that said, I don't want to sit and have conversations with women. They only want to talk about that we're changing and things like that. I want conversations with men. It's more meaningful. And then as I grew, I discovered that I was surrounded by a beautiful bouquet of women friends and the different gifts that they gave me. And I realized that that's what I had developed in myself. That's why I could see it in them. And I had a, a very <coughs> low self-acceptance when I started. I talked about not, not liking my name, hating my name. And uh, in, in recovery and in spiritual growth, I've learned to love me, not in a egotistical way, but in a respectful way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so that's forging for me. Well said, in a respectful way. Yeah. Um, you said something else I wanted to comment on, but maybe it'll come back to me. Anybody else on forging relationships or how your life has changed with relationships that you've released a lot. Well to, to me forging a relationship takes work. Mm -hmm. you know, you've got to open up you 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 develop this friendship. And when that relationship for whatever reason person dies or, or moves or there's a hole left in your life. Mm -hmm. And and you go out and try to fill it by again doing some more forging and coming up with new friends. And, and I think that's that's life as, as you move through life, especially at this age, you know, they're checking out all the time. You need, you need to be open to new friends, new acquaintances, new relationships, or all of a sudden you're going to be very lonely. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, and again, that reminded me of the importance of the spiritual community. <clears throat> You know, where we develop uh, really close relationships with one another based on spiritual principles. I mean, it's a place to uh, be with people of like mind and 
find new relationships. And can I just add that like, part of this foraging is uh, knowing, like coming to know yourself and what is it, what kinds of people do I need and what kinds of community do I need in my life right now? And then now as I'm just starting to go out and I talk to people and I think that I really like that person, but we don't really have a lot in common. Um, so this would be a person I'd be happy to be in community with and to enjoy a community with, but it's not someone who maybe I can talk to death. And I'm, I've always been used to talking to the death and I have to learn different levels of, of relationship. I think they're true. Different types of relationship and we need, we need a lot of them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The richness of the rainbow the of rainbow. personality. Yeah. 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 I, I remember uh, when I, in 2014, I left the church I was serving in the San Diego area and I devoted myself to being a life coach. And I was just, I thought I was just ready. I, you know, I want another lifestyle. I don't want to work on Sundays anymore. I want my weekends back. And, uh, but what I noticed was I was lonesome for a spiritual community. And I, so I went on, I went, I tried a few. And I went to, I may even share this on Sunday talking about spiritual community, but I went to the Self Realization Fellowship, which is renowned in San Diego. And uh, the service was lovely. Uh, what's so interesting is here's here is the self realization fellowship. You know, not only they can do, but embrace all religions. And up on the altar there in the uh, temple, where the picture was Jesus Christ, a picture of Jesus, along with uh, other spiritual teachers. And so, uh, but here's the thing: I try, I don't know how many Sundays I went there. Uh, I love the message, but I was not once greeted. You were not what? Greeted. 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 Yeah, right. uh, mm -hmm. And I didn't get the community feeling there. And uh, you know, for many, that's probably fun. I wanted a spiritual community to feel a part of. So that's what's so important to me about this community, that people, when they walk in the doors on Sunday morning, feel like they come into a circle of love, you know, a circle of companionship and friendship. Right, Kath? Yeah. Kathy's used to hearing me say this. Even the music that um, that's part of the community can make a difference. Like yeah. if you grew up and you love the old man and you come to a church like this, you're not gonna, it's not gonna feel the same. And right. the, the music at the um, Self-Realization Fellowship are you know, beyond his hands. And, and you have to be able to in, really get afflicted by that. Yeah. So when I first came on Zoom to see this church, I was like, oh my goodness, you know, I'm <laughs> tapping my foot. And it's not like this one little two minute intro. It's like 10 minutes of music at the beginning. And uh, and it's really fun live. I mean, I was able to get out. <laughs> it is fun live. And when you find something that kind of fits a community that has some of the ingredients in it, yeah, I don't know if you online heard that, but I was talking about finding a spiritual community that fits your your energy. Yeah, um, and has something that you want. Something that you want. Okay, I'm moving. Uh, hey, Kat, would you do me, do us a favor? Would you uh, Google the word forge and see what it says, and then come back and let us know? I was going to comment on that. Yes. <laughs> Well, forge when you're talking about shoeing horseshoes and you put the uh, oh, horseshoe yeah. down there, that speaks up a lot on, on what you're doing. You know. Then the other is 
forging a check. That's not such a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I'm sure you're which model, which meaning you want us to use here. <laughs> it's also heat. Yeah, yes. it's heat. Uh, and that's what Google says. <laughs> both mean the same thing. The forge is to make a horseshoe. The forge a check is to make one. <laughs> so it, it's the same. So Same what are we making here? Yeah, yeah. 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 He's going to tell us what. The, what uh, <laughs> you ready? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Let's, 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 yeah. The definition of forge is to make or shape a metal object by heating it in a fire or furnace and beating or hammering it, beating it. <laughs> is that all it says about forge? Well, that was a simple definition. You want me to go and give you more? <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, more, yeah. um, the next one is to create a relationship or new conditions. But there, yeah. new to relationship. create a relationship, what? Or new relation or, or new conditions. A new conditions to create a relationship. So like you create anything, right? What does it take to create a relationship? Um, so to heat up metal, you know that <laughs> have any of you had friends like that that really heat up metal? <laughs> I have a daughter like that. Did you like to say a little more about that? <laughs> <laughs> there are uh, relationships that um, that demand uh, a certain shaping of my thinking to have a fit that's going to work. Like a horseshoe on the foot of a horse. You got to shape the horseshoe to fit the hook of the horse, but you got to heat the metal to create the horseshoe. So I've had uh, anyone had any heated relationships? Who <laughs> has? <laughs> or, or, or heated conversations? <coughs> the paradox of truth. Um, when you were talking about heating up, I was thinking, though, about having someone fire me up. In other words, um, give me energy because we have that connection, like the connection I have with Jody. It's like when we talk with each other, we're so connected and we're so open and honest with each other that it it fires me up inside and gives me um, energy to want to be better. Great, great. Fire, I like that. And then back to the horseshoe metaphor. I, I love metaphors when we think about spiritual truth. Back to the uh, horseshoe metaphor. Without a horseshoe, what happens to the horse's hook? Ouch. It can't tread in certain areas without getting hurt, right? I think that's the same with friendships, right? Friendships help us go through the rough times. How? You're speaking of relationships and, and forging. We, uh, you know, banks are basically most of you probably think the bank is very impersonal. We don't get a big cash and such and such. But we belong to a bank in Sun City West, where no matter whether I go to the teller inside or what I drive, when I drive up to the remote teller, they call me by name. Howard, how are you? They know my wife Susan. Oh. I haven't seen you lately. If, if you go to oh. Into the teller and inside, they say, "Why are you doing here? You always go through the dragon window." But they know my name every single moment in that that day. Now that's the difference between forging a relationship. It would be hard pressed for me to leave the Chase Bank because everybody knows me. They, call me. they recognize me as being a human being. And, and we've all gone to restaurants where the waiter is just ignoring you, sorry. And they probably get lesser of a tip than the waitress or waiter that comes over to your table and smiles at you, makes a short conversation that is attended. So I don't understand why people don't understand the power of relationship. I hear you. I hear you. Awareness. Hey, John. Quoted from Cheers. It's a place where everybody knows your name. Oh, <laughs> I love that. Yeah, a place where everybody knows your name. You feel welcome. Yeah. 
Yeah. Could I add something? Um, about a spiritual community, I've belonged to large churches and even the Unity of Phoenix is pretty large. And I was a member for over 10 years, but never really formed any relationships until I, I put myself out there by going to some of the small groups, you know, the classes, joining, had, you know, I, I needed to join things and then I needed to be a little more um, authentic and reach out to people. And then it's just been beautiful. I forged a relationship with a woman I never thought I would be close friends with. Actually, when I first met her, I didn't really like her very much, but we've become very close friends and we have more in common than, than I thought. And you know, she's even from a different country, but we, and she's 10 years older than me, but we've had a wonderful relationship. And then that's led to us exposing each other to other things. So it's just been beautiful, but you, you have to, well, you can't just, you know, be around people. You have to, you have to connect. You have to make an effort and and let them know who you are and be interested in who they are and be fully in the moment. And what I wanted to say earlier with one of the other topics was one thing that I've learned is I used to always be so busy and multitask. And now when I'm with somebody, I'm with them. You know, I didn't real. I realized I wasn't even just when I was raising my boys, I wasn't with them. And one of my sons even told me, mom, you're there, but you're not really there because my mind was somewhere else. So giving someone your undivided full attention is such a gift and that's forging a, a strong relationship, I think. It is, thank you, thank you. Uh, and, what, and that's what you were referring to, my, you know, you gotta reach out. Relationships are the alchemy of life. And I think we've speak, spoken to this, right? In what ways have you been transformed by your relationship? <laughs> um, anyone want to comment more about in what ways you've been transformed by your relationship? Diane? I'd have to say every way. I mean, I, I've lived in different cultures and I've been in so many different settings professionally and I've sat with so many different people that have taught me so <coughs> much um, you know and and the, the good and the bad just hearing their stories about some some things about you know um, broken things yeah. and it's, it's, it's quite beautiful humans are quite beautiful and challenging. I mean, I, I had a question with my daughter because she's a totally different personality. And so it gives us that ability, relationship, to, to grow so much. Right. And right. especially if we get this gift of years. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, forging. Forging. Okay. I'm going on. The elders know what it means to be family, citizen, free, and slave. They know the difference between evolution and revolution, and there is room for both. And I think um, I think a couple of you have spoken to that, evolution and revolution, room for both. What, what do you have to say about that? I don't want to <laughs> anyway, as I've aged, I've, I have evolved. You know, in my youth, if somebody brings up the subject like my sister won't take the vaccine because, you know, the, the hidden bunch of people out there eating babies and there's all kinds of I, I used to argue those points. I've now learned to evolve. I've evolved to the point to just change that subject. <laughs> You're not going there with that person. And, and I think as I've gotten older, I, I, I become more of a chameleon where I can accept the person, the good parts of that person for what they believe and what I, what I believe and, and push aside those thorns that may, uh, may not be uh, to my liking. Yeah. And so I think that's where, you know, I would turn around. I, I went through revolution 
by evolution, and I'm now more of a accepting chameleon. I hear you great. Great. Who else? On uh, evolution and revolution. So I was I was in uh, college in the late 60s, and uh, it just seemed like uh, revolution was necessary, and I, I got involved in in thinking I could do some change, and then I saw how dangerous that was and how it didn't work. And I figured out I needed to that my revolution had to be one where I did something with my own life. Mm -hmm. And so that is that's been my revolution is teaching and um, trying to to make ch make children understand that they they have choice and learn those those values those human values that make us good people. Um, but I still I still get riled up. <laughs> you know these last these last years have been difficult to know how to respond right but they're a gift but it's been a gift because i came here for to be with my 92 year old mother who is very much uh, different politically and everything and we were thrown together with the pandemic with the only two people and that so i had to learn how to like you were saying how to, how to step back and not let my anger take over yeah I'm gonna I'm gonna share this online because I'm not sure that they all heard you. And that was my was talking about earlier days and being a part of the uh, the wild and crazy '60s uh, revolution and um, the protest, pretty much around the Vietnam War, and and then uh, as she evolved to how she began to see that the revolution that was needed was in her and, uh, and learning to accept uh, differences and not fight them. So she's living with your, is it your mom? Why not your mom, right? Well, I'm not looking, but uh, we're here, here, here. We're a few minutes apart. Yeah, uh, 93 year old mom. 93? Yeah, great. I had an insurance, I mean, a uh, financial planner tell me, uh, we're calculating your retirement based on you living until 94. And I go, wow. Yeah. <laughs> 94? Huh? I never thought of it in that way. So 93, great. But anyway, um, so the evolution and revolution activity. When I thought about revolution, if you look at the, um, the, the Latin meaning, or even the prefix re, which means to, uh, again, to turn it around. And volare is to turn. Volver in Spanish is to turn. So revolution is to turn something around. Okay, more. Even more important is the call to elders to pass these stories on. What stories are important to you to pass on to the next generation? Um, this is Eileen. With my family, um, I come from a, a family of Mormons who some of them even came from England to uh, get uh, freedom of religion. And so um, a lot of them came across the country being persecuted because of their religion. And so those stories of holding true to your faith and uh, living your life according to your principles, no matter what happens, um, especially when you're persecuted to hold and stand um, fast with what you believe um, is so important. Great, great, thank you. Well, what stories are important for you to pass on to the next generation? Um, I'll yeah. speak. Um, when I retired, I, 
all of a sudden felt this urge to write an article that would kind of summarize the um, what I wanted the younger generation of nurses to know. And uh, so I did get it published and actually it's gonna be republished, I think in the uh, Arizona Nurses Journal, you know, coming up. But anyways, it was just about being courageous. And I had examples from my early days as a nurse and then my middle years and my later years about when, it when I had to make a decision and I even had a boss say, say to me, well, that's a career lim limiting move. You know, when I had to say, no, I wouldn't do something that he wanted to do that I thought might harm patients. And, um, and there were times when I did uh, end up having to leave a job because I stood up for what I felt was the best for the patients and kept my um, integrity as far as being a nurse and as a person. So uh, I felt that was important and I'm glad I did it. And I hope it maybe helps other people who may have read, may read that to do the same thing, to stand up for their beliefs, because uh, it's, it's easy for the workplace to try to get you off track and take the easy road instead of what you know is right. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Yeah, I mean, stop and think of the stories that were passed on to you, you know, by your parents or grandparents, uncles, aunts. And, and when you think about all that you have learned, yeah. Here I go again, I'm sorry, but a, a few years back when I suddenly realized I was mortal. <laughs> and uh, I, I got thinking that there's so many questions I love to ask my grandfather, my mother, my father, and, and they're, they're gone and they can't answer those questions. So I wrote my autobiography, it's oh, about 150 cool. pages and it starts out with a pair of baby shoes and it says, come walk with me and I, and I, oh. I carry you through my life. Oh. And, and I believe as you read it, my brothers and sisters who know me better than anybody else suddenly knew me. The, the, the big negative with writing your autobiography is now, Anybody that reads it now knows the real you, <laughs> at least the you you think is there. Uh, and and there's there some risk involved in that, but it's all written down. And when, when I'm gone, if uh, a grandchild or something, and that's primarily why I did it, because we adopted a, grand, a granddaughter late in life, and uh, we didn't, my daughter did. Um, Isabella's seven, my daughter's 53 or something like that. So, she won't know what my life was like, and she can pick that up and read about this grandfather that she can remember. Great. So I, I, I would highly recommend everybody sit down and yeah, just write the story. You don't have to write an autobiography. You'll be surprised. Just write the stories that come to your mind in life, and after a year or so, you look at all those stories and say, "Damn, if I had this, this, and this, I got an autobiography." It, that is a tremendous gift. I wish that my mom and dad had taken the time to do that. And I haven't done it for my kids yet. But I know that I, I've heard from a number of my friends that they've gone into classes in continuing education uh, programs where it's uh, to write your autobiography. Um, I think it's a great idea to leave for our kids or anybody else behind us. Yeah, Karen? Uh, I see different levels of this. One of them, and I don't know how to put it into words, but the um, truth sayer that a grandparent can be mm. when a, a child tells their child how they did or didn't do things. And the grandparent says, well, no, that's not quite the way it was. <laughs> you know. <laughs> that that kind of thing, and it's a, a really healthy thing. And then the other is in my um, recovery in alcoholism, I find it very important for me to tell my family what it was like, what happened, um, for their health and and their safety. Um, and then on the spiritual side. I've had a number of um, kind of 
lifetime war experience. Uh, I've had a number of, oh, I guess woo experience. <laughs> the only way I could put it, and passing those on to people, especially uh, if I get a family member that's getting rigid. Mm -hmm. And uh, if I have a minute, I'm, I learned something from an oncologist that I had. Uh, I went through uh, radiation for throat cancer, and they said, you're going to uh, be in the hospital on morphine and so forth. And when I got done, I didn't lose any weight at all. It was the one thing I thought would be good. <laughs> it happened out of this whole thing. And, and so when I was done, I decided, I probably don't think I want to eat because it's not fun to eat. I have to take lidocaine syrup in order to swallow things. And why not? I mean, it's a good fucking diet, right? And this oncologist had a beautiful way of communicating to me. Well, Karen. Every calorie you take in over basic metabolism goes toward healing. Goes toward healing. healing. And that that way of communicating, I remember that and, and I respect that so much. It wasn't contentious. Right. It just it was it was free and informative and and I wanted to keep that. I wanted to do that. Anyway, next one. Yeah. So um, the doctor kind of turned around that perspective, right, and lifted it up. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I think I want to eat. Yeah. yeah. I want to get better. Yeah. Great. Great. Diane? Well, having a new grandson is really a um, happy grandkid. I bought an Amazon journal on the grandmother's journal because when my daughter was born, I thought I would write in a journal every day. <laughs> and it got to shaking your head, Susan. It got, it got to your one, and that was, you know. So the, these journals that they do, that's a good, that's a good prompt. And also I'm in the class that's about writing your spiritual will for um, you know, my loved ones. I'm already picking out uh, pictures and, and notes and you know things that I I want them all to, to sing, not necessarily together, but individually thinking about the that process. And then the last one I'm doing is remember when that, that woman did that we pray love? Yes. yes. I, I had to laugh at that because I went from Italy to Australia to Alaska. And so I'm writing one that's called Eat Swim Freeze. <laughs> just as a joke for my for my grandson again to talk about some of my adventures and what I, and what I learned in the different places like you went to India. It was just so much that we learned, all of us, that we uh, you know can can make this one. Eat, swim, breeze. breeze. <laughs> you know, I should come up with a better part for Alaska because that was a very metaphysical place. Very metaphysical, but yeah. That was what I was pretty cool. <laughs> putting down memories of what I learned in each place. Um, you know, I like that spiritual journal thing. Yeah, That's spiritual good. will. There's spiritual courses will. about doing the spiritual will. And it just, um, and I think there's several books on the intuition of doing the spiritual will. I actually am um, at the Franciscan Center in Portland, and oh. that's where I got some of that. Spiritual, um, will. spiritual will. I can't remember the name of the title. I think the book has been gone now for a few months. I wish I kind of started. But yeah, that's where you can put down your philosophy. Yeah. Uh, we were talking about how you change from, you know, not now necessarily getting into it with everybody and just letting people be. And, uh, you know, so some of those little words of wisdom for these intriguing, these, these grandkids and these kids coming up. What a great idea. What a great idea. I love it. Anybody online want to speak to this anymore before I move on? Okay, then. The tail bearers are proof of the authenticity of the past. I think we've been speaking to that, right? Mm -hmm. As we tell the stories, um, we authenticate our experience. So it's not only for those who will read it or hear the story, it's for our own self. To authenticate our own experience. 
What are the important tales that were passed down to you, ones that have helped you or inspired you? We've spoken about that a little bit too. I, I can share, um, when I was about 12, I found um, a really old book in our in my mom's my dad's little library, a very expensive library in my theater. And it happened to be a great, great aunt. So it was from one of my first published books, I think. And it, she was a poet. Mm -hmm. And something really connected with me that you could write these words that are kind of hard to understand. Her poetry wasn't understandable to me, really. But it just made me feel like I wanted to be a poet. I wanted to be able to express myself like that and pass something down yeah. that maybe somewhere some great, great niece would pick this up and get some sort of inspiration. Beautiful. So it was, that's, that's one that I can say. Inspired me, even though I couldn't connect with her words. But it somehow, somehow it sounds like your soul did. But but some, it just said something that to me. It yeah. spoke to me. Did you all hear Maya? She found a book of uh, poetry that her aunt had great, great, great aunt. Great mom. Really old. <laughs> okay. Anyone else on this one? Yeah, I have a comment. Is yes. um, Kathy. One of the things that my parents passed down to me was the was a strong work ethic, and um, they did it by relating different things that happened in their own work lives that were difficult. They got through it, and then it was celebration. So it was like good stuff came out of going through the tough stuff and and just being responsible and and dependable. And um, it's, it turns out kind of fun. And so we kind of grew up with that attitude. And all of us have, uh, all of my sisters and I all have a really strong work ethic where you just go to work even if you don't feel like it because you know you're going to like it. I love that. And I'm very grateful that they passed that on to you. <laughs> I'd like to add uh, something. Um, I didn't know my dad very well, and my mother died when I was just 30. I wasn't that wise back then, and my mother didn't share very much about our dad. So what I really valued was before my great aunt died, I sat down with her, and she told me all kinds of things about my mom and dad that I didn't know, and I wrote like crazy, you know, try to get everything down, and then I, I typed it all up, and I gave it to my other two sisters. And I and they now they told me later how much that really meant to them. Oh. And then another story that's very that is very meaningful to me is um, my two sisters Barbara and Patty never got along very well. But when my sister Patty really needed help, my younger sister Barbara stepped in and actually became her guardian and conservator. Oh. And Patty had all kinds of problems. She'd been taken advantage of and lost all of her money and was. You know, had to file for bankruptcy, but Barbara took care of Patty, and she shared the story of how she uh, went through the court and her learning curve of how she learned to love and respect and find um, peace with her relationship with Patty. And Patty died a year ago, but Barbara shared all those more and more about that and her journey, and that story means a lot to me. And actually, I think I might write something about that because that was a great major transformation for them. And then them sharing with me as Barbara sharing it with me is such a gift. So. It's a great teaching story, isn't it? Yes. About how to heal uh, relationships. Mm -hmm. I have something I'd do. Yes. Yeah, I, I, I think mine impressed me by the stories that came down to me, my family were from Texas and something that my family members go all the way back to the time uh, they served with Sam Houston at San Jacinto in the War of the Republic. Uh, they're also, very, my father was very much a cowboy and they used to, when they came to Arizona, they, they used to uh, catch and break wild horses to, you know, here, uh, to use on the ranches. So anyway, I think that, and then the, and then during the war, they went in 
and they served in Europe and uh, the Pacific, and one died in the Pacific. But so I think that that strong American sense of uh, you know going back, and I mean it, it. It's just I think that it just gave me that to be you know the American spirit feeling, and it has a spiritual sense to it, of course. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, is there a cowboy in you, Elba? Huh? Is there a cowboy in you? Oh, I can ride a horse. I'm not a cowboy. <laughs> My dad, I mean, he worked cattle and rode horses. Now, nah, I'm lucky. I've never been thrown off one. I'm I, I'm the cowboy. If you ever throwed me, I wouldn't get back on. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank yeah. you. Thank you for that. Sam Houston, huh? Ooh. Wow. Yeah. Wild, wild west. Yeah, it's quite a way. That's back in the 1830s. Wow. Okay, finally, this was the third subject. Um, when physical eyesight declines, spiritual insight increases. And I think, I mean, that's kind of been at the center of what much of what we've been saying is, right? As, as we, not about eyesight, but as we've grown older, our spiritual insight has increased. And uh, this is all about letting go. So, what do you have to say about letting go and spiritual insight? All day workshop again. <laughs> Our all day workshop. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, think I, think, much, I think much of spiritual learning is letting go of a lot of our old beliefs. They don't serve us anymore. They don't serve us anymore. Yes. Pruning, pruning. Okay. I think we've come to a stopping point right here. Uh, anyone else want to comment before I close this prayer? Could you tell me who's the lady in the top? Yeah, we should identify ourselves, right? Uh, starting with you, Carol, would you identify yourself for those of us sitting here? That's Sharon. You hold that and leave it here. On the top? Yeah. Who is that lady on the oh, top? Oh, I mean the one she used to be on the top that chair. <laughs> Those of you online, please introduce yourself. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Carol Dobus. Great. And beneath uh, Carol is unmute, Jody. Um, you're I'm introducing myself. Are you just wanting to know my name? I yeah. Okay, I'm Jody Jacobs. And Chandler, Arizona. Oh. And below Jody is my crack admin, whose work, work ethic I love. <laughs> I'm Kathy <laughs> Collins. <laughs> She's crack only. <laughs> and uh, under Kathy is Eileen, would you want me to introduce yourself? Yes, I'm Eileen Barber, and uh, I'm Judy Phillips, back here in the background. Both from yes. Chandler. Yes. Uh, Judy is an artist. Eileen is a master cook. Oh. <laughs> Among other things. Mm -hmm. And would you introduce yourself, Cowboy? Hey, Cowboy. Yo. <laughs> oh, Alva. Morning. All the morning. So, and those of us in here will start over here. Just let's go around the circle quick. Maya, Joy, Diane, Karen, May Joe, Linda, Howard, Susan, Jane, Karen. It's up at the Mickey Mouse Club. <laughs> <laughs> God for this group of people doing spiritual exploration and so generously sharing. We give thanks for the energy of this time together, for all of the blessings that we've experienced in the moment and that will continue to bless us throughout this day and week. 
And so we go into the rest of our day with great joy in our hearts, with happy thoughts and with peace of mind. We give thanks and go with happy expectation of a beautiful day. Amen. 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 Thank you all. Thank you. I'll see you next week. Thank you so much. Bye.